be. I think there is going to be some Republicans who say, well, I didn't like Trump, but I can put up with it. There will be Democrats who say, I wish there was a younger candidate, but it's Biden. That's fine. That's already been happening a little bit. But there's a big share of the country. Uh, I think it'd be bigger than 2016 that say, I just can't believe these are my choices. And that's going to be a lot of Democratic strategy is that's right. Then you just stick it out with Biden. These again. are it's your like, choices. Yeah, like, you know, wait yeah. it out. Like if we beat Trump again, then you don't have to worry about him in the future. Uh, not in a very inspiring campaign, but not every campaign is inspiring. It is my pleasure to welcome to the podcast ace political reporter for Semaphore, formerly of the Washington Post. I got to know him on the presidential trail. He's a journalist I turn to to know what the heck is going on. Dave Weigel. Welcome, Dave. It's good to be here. Good to talk to you again. You too, man. Uh, so Semaphore, you took the startup leap. You've worked at a number of pubs. Washington Post is just about as establishment as it gets. Uh, what made you decide to, to join the new startup? Yeah, well, I never have been at a startup. I, I've been at stuff that was fairly recently founded. I worked for a nonprofit uh, in 2009 that was pretty new. And I worked at Slate, I don't know, 10, 15 years after it was founded. It still felt fairly new. But I'd never been so, at something since the beginning. Uh, I'd known Ben Smith, who's the editor-in-chief, for a very long time. And he'd been trying to work with me for a long time, which is nice of him. And uh, if you see the publication, uh, it it's experimenting with a kind of, pub, of publishing stories, organizing stories that is designed, everyone hopes, I hope too, designed to break through the uh, the impasse that a lot of readers have when they look at articles. The feeling, oh, I, this article is going to be very opinionated. I don't want to read that. The way that we, we structure articles is breaking it down into uh, the, the news some reporter opinion, some alternative opinion, uh, while making them good, readable stories. I thought that was interesting. So I wanted to, yeah, I thought, I, I don't know how many chances I get in my 40s to try something new. So I wanted to try something brand new. Uh, well, congrats on it, man. Most people know that I, I love new things, startups, uh, uh, a little bit of risk-taking. Though I, I will say, I mean, most people would consider working at the Washington Post something of a dream job. Uh, was it a tough decision? And, you know, obviously, you know, you yeah. made... Like a little bit of, um, you know, like I, I guess you were the subject of some uh, kerfuffles. <laughs> I don't know yeah, yeah. If, if that had anything to do with, uh, with, with the decision to leave the post. No, um, that wasn't. That was never fun. And one thing that you get at the post in general, or at any kind of big established institution, especially in media, is people uh, have a have a hot, hotter spotlight spotlight on, and they'll look for ways to. I guess ways to stoke drama. I mean, I'm I'm a big drama aficionado of, of like YouTubers and and people online who get into fights <laughs> with each other. I was never trying to get into a fight, but I could see that that happens sometimes. So I would say people still talk to me. I wasn't really worried people wouldn't wouldn't talk to me at a different publication. I did find, and I knew this would happen. There's some people who didn't like the post at all. There's some Republicans who just cut it off and didn't and wanted to cut the mainstream media out. Who will talk to an outlet that's that's new and will will. You know, give you give you time, answer the question. Even they, they blacklisted the paper. I don't support people blacklisting the paper, but that was different. So it shook up what I did. But less than, I mean, there's people who just do 180 degree turns. You know, they're working for some app company. They get hired, or they they're working for like a, a gigantic tech firm, and they work for some app company, and they risk everything. You know, they they give up the stock options. Like my risk was pretty low, but but it was yeah, it was, it was a hard thing to think about. But I mean, I had a uh, I agree, it's a it's a dream job, and especially in journalism, where a lot of things are not very are not very safe. Uh, the 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 post, if you were just doing the work and showing up and covering stories, felt very safe, and you're part of a big team. That is a good feeling, and there's not a lot of that in media. So there are two big things I wanted to discuss with you that I think are in a lot of people's minds. The first is uh, the the debt limit increase uh, in D.C. Um, so just to frame this, I talked to a Beltway insider who said the people who think this is going to work itself out are seeing something different than what I'm seeing. <laughs> that from their perspective, uh, the sides are digging in. Um, they both think it's going to be a loser for the other side. Um, one of the the tougher elements is that it's kind of got like a fuzzy uh, drop dead date or a timeline where. Yeah. 
um, Treasury came out and said, look, it's going to be end of May, June 1. Um, but then there's some skepticism around that date. <laughs> some, some people think you could push it. So the, so this setup to me is um, a terrible setup because you can easily see both sides playing their hands uh, and, and then just sliding past the, the deadline and then the market's crashing and maybe they, they can't uh, actually you know come to, to, to hammer something out in a matter of seconds or minutes, like it might take some more time. The most important thing that's changed since the last time we did this is that the last time happened. So uh, there was no precedent in people's memory in 2011, as a story I was on a lot, about what would happen if the U.S. ran up right to the edge of the debt limit or went over. Uh, apocalyptic warnings about what would happen. Uh, what did happen? Well, they had a deal. They kicked, they kicked the can. Uh, there was a, t- a credit downgrade that was an enormous news, some of the biggest news of the year that in, in the long run didn't really affect people uh, at, at all. I mean, I feel like it's trivia at this point that it happened. So that's that's the most uh, vivid thing affecting the politics right now is that you have people who lived through what they were told was a crisis and nothing happened that yep. they remember, that they remember being important. Uh, and so that's... That is, I think, why it took such a long time for this to build up. I mean, there might even be some exhaustion reporters who covered the first round of this, and everyone's 12 years older, and they think, well, I know how this ends, you know, the old availability heuristic. It happened to me this way once. It's probably going to happen to me that way again. Um, but you're, So, as you said, there is not a, a set date on it. That's another thing we learned uh, this time. The Treasury will put out an announcement of when we're going to go over. And in 2011, that was covered as, this is it. We're all going to be uh, eating cat food when they hit that date. What it means is that you hit that date, the Treasury is going to move money around extraordinary circumstances. Uh, so it's going to be an impasse for a while. I think I do think I keep referring to how people learned from the last time. Uh, the people who with money in this, which is a lot, a lot of them, have been pressuring the White House more than the White House expected to just sign what, what something that Republicans in the House give them. The White House's position was we live through this. Literally, Joe Biden lived through this. Um, we're we've learned that if you treat this like a real negotiation. Uh, you don't benefit. You end up having to give something up and you get uh, a credit downgrade anyway. What's the point of negotiating? They also thought, I think, um, and this can work in politics, I'm not sure it's working right now, if you just don't treat it like it's real, uh, you don't treat it like like, like negotiation is, is legitimate, then you can shape the coverage. People say, well, yeah, why am I paying attention to this? <laughs> to these things? A lot of it is just getting people to blame Republicans. And if they see a headline that says U.S. hit the debt limit for them to say, I wish those Republicans would deal with it. That's not very 4D, 5D chess. Uh, it, it is just the idea of waiting until the crisis and hoping that most people will blame Republicans. Uh, that has not happened to the degree the White House thought it would. You've got you know b- business groups that are saying just work the Republicans on this. But it's not blowing them up either. They're not going around the country getting protested with uh, people demanding they take the deal. It's a very inside Washington story at this point. Oh, yeah. I, I think that you've hit the nail on the head where each side thinks that if there is a massive problem, the other side will pay the price. Yes. Um, you know, like the uh, – I mean the White House thinks like, hey, people are of course going to blame the Republicans for this. And the Republicans are like they're going to blame Biden for this because he's the president. Uh, and so each of them has a theory of the case. You know, I, I think that there's going to be plenty of blame to go around. But like, uh, you know, I, I look at this and say, um, this is a very nasty setup. Like, this is not a setup for success. <laughs> Where, because, you know, the, the, the White House is saying, look, uh, we're not going to negotiate. Uh, this is a fake negotiation. We're uh, just going to ask for a clean Uh, debt limit increase. And I do not think McCarthy and the Republicans can deliver a clean debt limit increase after everything they've been through. I think it would cost McCarthy a speakership. Um, So so, uh, I don't think they're going to get a clean debt limit increase. So something's going to have to give. Yeah. And there is stuff to give away. I mean, uh, it's so dull to get into the way (laughs) the way it ended last time you you can yo you can say these two words man because the two words i'm hearing are permitting reform (laughs) (laughs) well yeah so permitting reform is a good example there's some stuff that that people basically agree on that could be included in something that is not clean um but what happened last time was there was a a, the, the debt limit fight happened in a larger conversation uh, that really was stoked by well-funded groups, Pete Peterson's group, uh, Senate Committee for Responsible Federal Budget. There was – it's very weird if you 
have you know even a journalist understanding of micro of macroeconomics. It was a period where like the biggest problem facing the country was not the national debt. It was it was the labor market. It was unemployment. Um, the biggest problem facing the country right now, definitely not unemployment. It's more inflation. So the conditions were not actually relevant to do it for a debt crisis in 2011. But what happened was a huge conversation. We all agree we need to shrink this debt. We spent all this money on the stimulus. Uh, what can we do to get to the table so that maybe Republicans are going to trade tax increases for something else? But what happened last time was there was a big, robust, okay, there's never been a crisis like this. Everyone, meaning everyone in D.C., kind of fueled by these these pressure groups, everyone's talking about the debt, we should do something. And that's not been happening this time, because everyone in Washington lived through a Trump administration that, once it was in power, got rid of the spending <laughs> spending caps as part of those debt deals, just kept kept plowing ahead and spending money. But Republicans are not even going as as, as broad as they did uh, 12 years ago. Like the, They went out of their way this time to not touch any entitlement program in the deal. So the and I, I, I should I could truncate what I'm saying is in 2011, it, the idea was this is so unprecedented. This is the time to do gigantic reforms that we all agree America must do. It's been over, overdue. That's not the debate this time. It's OK. Well, we need to give in to some demands. Republicans have some things that they want to cut and reverse. They want to get reverse parts of the Inflation Reduction Act. Um, we, they want permitting reform. Uh, they want to claw back unspent COVID money. It is less than Republicans were demanding last time. Be, last time, because just I think things have changed, and they're post Trump. The Republican Party is not interested in entitlement reform, Social Security cuts, Medicare cuts, Medicaid cuts. Sure, but but not the rest of it. So it's like a very it's a much smaller debate, which is which is also playing into this. You're not as as invested if you're watching this from the outside from Wall Street because. The, the the deal a deal that would make Democrats unhappy that would make Republicans feel like they won something um, you just started to describe it it would be well we cut we cut some of Biden's spending priorities and we we have some environmental uh, policies that Democrats didn't want that we got through that wouldn't be enormous that really that that stuff that honestly a well functioning Congress could probably just vote vote on normally sure. <laughs> like the old co Congresses of fifty years ago could just say well here comes a crisis what can we trade so the stakes are the stakes are lower and it's much I don't want to say silly um but it's 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 having a tougher time getting into the public consciousness for all those reasons you know people live through it stakes are lower there's less being demanded and the white and democrats are convinced all right we th if we just don't treat this like it's legitimate that's never we've never tried that before we've never we've never just pretended that this isn't real we can't we don't have to negotiate what'll happen if we hold out as long as possible well i i do want to to uh say on one level the stakes are higher uh, my read of the situation is that um, they're going to play chicken, uh, and yeah. um, uh, and that they're not going to do the reasonable thing until they're forced to do so. And by the time they're forced to do so, I think there could be some significant repercussions. I think the market's fragile with these bank failures and the rest of it. I think confidence is fragile. Uh, like you know, th th this is just like going to be a self-inflicted wound um, if they get to a point where it starts having uh, real market repercussions. How do you think this plays out? So one possibility is the White House gets to the precipice and says, all right, uh, none of this is real. We're going to find a way to keep funding the government, and we're not going to be taken host hostage. Another way is that, is that... Is that AKA the trillion dollar coin? <laughs> yeah, I mean, that they say they can't pull off. But I'm saying until, until we reach that moment and they officially rule it out, you can't 100% rule that out. Um, before, the other options are, are much more pedestrian and, 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 and normal, which is, okay... We we reach this point in the negotiation. We're willing to sign off on a few after not negotiating. We're willing to sign off a few things they wanted, which is I've not negotiated many debt limit deals or many of these deals that like this. But being obstinate, saying no, absolutely nothing, and then giving part of what Republicans want, um, and then at that point maybe you throw it to the House and you can put the onus on Republicans in the House. Um, will they pass something that's less than what they demanded? And to the extent the 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 gamesmanship of this is up, up, like that's the, that's where we're at the, at the story at the moment. The one one thing I will say, would say though, the Democratic base, which remember the, the same position where Barack Obama's running for re-election in 2011, 2012, uh, the threat was that Republicans might tank the economy while he's running for re-election. Uh, Biden is running for re-election; just announced it. The th the threat is is similar, um, but there's less. Apart from just the losing face, there are fewer things 
being negotiated that would anger the Democratic base. There was a possibility that, that uh, Obama could have gone in, let's say one of the versions of the, of the debt limit deal had passed. Obama could go in as the first Democratic president to agree to uh, in a very long time on, on social, social security cuts. Um, what would that have done to the excitement of the base? What would that what, what would that have done to Democratic activists? We saw how within four years there was a, a, a primary challenge to Hillary Clinton. There was the Bernie Sanders campaign. What would that have done? I think it would have disrupted things with, inside the party. I don't think anything being negotiated right now would disrupt things the same way. There would be disappointment by a lot of liberals uh, who say, "Why the president looks weak for having compromised at all? He he should have minted the coin." Uh, I, I think the coin's a good like way to just say <laughs> he should have done something that just cuts get rid of the whole controversy. But it wouldn't be the same thing like he betrayed he betrayed us. I think there would if there and it, permitting reform is something a lot of Democrats were going to agree to anyway. I think there yeah. will be would be a backlash from the environmental left on that. Uh, but most of the backlash would be we don't like it when our team loses. Less we don't like it when our team undermines the the New Deal. That was the risk in twenty twelve uh, twenty eleven. We are living in the era of big tech, AI, chat GPT, generative tools, and these big tech companies have made it a habit to pick up everything we are doing online. Why should they get our data and we're left out in the cold? It's reasons like this that I use ExpressVPN to hide my unique IP address to make it harder for big tech to track me and my identity and activity and encrypt all of my online comings and goings. And it's not like you have to be a tech whiz to use ExpressVPN. Literally just tap one button on your phone or computer to activate it. You don't want your family to be vulnerable and one subscription to ExpressVPN covers me, my wife, and my kids on up to five devices. So stop letting big tech leech on your data freely. Use my link expressvpn.com slash yang right now and you can get three extra months free. That's E-X-P-R-E-S-S VPN.com slash yang to get protected with a VPN rated number one by CNET, TechRadar, and most importantly, me, expressvpn.com slash yang. So let's turn to what you just said about Joe Biden running for re-election. All right, so I, 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 yeah, I travel the country and... Um, when, when I say to folks, hey, Biden-Trump rematch, they're like groans, the head shaking. I mean, you probably get the same thing. Yeah, uh, It shows up in the numbers. The majority of Democrats uh, don't even want Joe to run again. Um, and when I say, like, hey, it's got to be Joe, for months people have been like, no, that's impossible. <laughs> yeah. And I've been like, oh, everything I'm seeing here is it's Joe. Even now, there is some scuttlebutt that even though Joe's declared, the announcement video and everything else, um, that there still might be a switch in nominees uh, before the August convention next year on the Democratic side. So is it Joe Biden uh, the the whole way through uh, in terms of being on the ticket and the general election next November? Oh, man, I think this is an enormous question. Uh, and uh, so I have the same, uh, the same interactions you do. Um, you travel probably more than me. I travel a lot. We, tra- we both travel more than most people. I'd say yeah. it's fair to say, right? Uh, and yeah, I heard that until the midterms, uh, I heard just disbelief that Biden could run again. And even if a Democrat, they were, maybe they weren't watching viral videos or, you know, super cuts of Biden um, mixing up words in a speech or something. They didn't believe the he can't handle the job stuff. But really, since uh, the Afghanistan withdrawal and, and the effects of that, I definitely heard this idea. Well, obviously they're going to run somebody who's not who's not Biden. Is it going to be is it going to be Kamala? Is there an alternative Kamala? And the midterms uh, ended that conversation because they went so well for Democrats. I think he is the nominee unless uh, something, which is always awkward to discuss. I mean, I, the, the, some people do it for political reasons. I'm just doing it for pr- the practical. What do people tell me? Reasons. If something happens, if he's much less healthy, if he if he's unable to show up for work, if there's some medical crisis. That sort of thing. We don't do not have a uh, recent, uh, you know, TV era precedent for that. The closest you get, honestly, and I'm not trying to be glib about it, but is uh, you know, Hillary Clinton fainting, fainting from pneumonia after uh, at the 9/11 anniversary ceremony in 2016. That was seen as such a crisis for the Democrats at the time that uh, Donna Brazile, the DNC chair, uh, the interim DNC chair, because remember 
um, Debbie Wasserman Schultz resigns over the yeah, I uh, DNC sure. building. And she's admit, admitted pretty soon after the election that she started to look up. What are the alternatives? Like, if, if Hillary's sick, do we have to, re- how, how do we replace her? And, you know, wouldn't you know it, in 2016, the alter- alternative she, she was going to propose, or I shouldn't say she was going to propose, the alternative she came up with, you know, uh, instantly was Joe Biden, Cory Booker ticket. <laughs> it was like, should we just replace this ticket with Joe Biden and Cory Booker? Um, and they didn't get there, but there was enough of a, enough of a fear that a candidate seen as medically unable to serve could not win the election. And so could that happen to Biden? I think I would not rule it out. If you're being, uh, being honest, you can't rule it out. If you are asking the White House on record a question, it is a rude question to ask. They're not going to answer it. You know, you talk to a Democratic Party chair in a state, they will, they don't dignify the question. But that is, I, I it's unusual uh, gap I've seen between the conversation from people who are you know, Americans and will vote uh, <laughs> for president and are unhappy that, about their possible choices, and the D.C. Democratic conversation was, which is not that just D.C. states, of course, will nominate Joe Biden again. I think. That attitude right now, that's dominant. There is no interest in these state parties in in a real challenge. By by real challenge, what I mean just let's say a governor who uh could would hire uh operatives who are very well known in democratic politics who are willing to risk their careers by going against Biden. That sort of conflict and I am privileging like the you know media's perspective here. Why is that more legitimate than uh you know, Dennis Kucinich managing Robert F. Kennedy's campaign? There are reasons for it. I mean, I, I, I the, the, as far as I'll go is Kennedy is not running the kind of campaign, uh, you know, going to states, getting Democratic uh, support, talking about issues that 90 percent Democratic voters agree with him on. Um, Marion Williamson is talking about those issues, but is kind of not getting the attention. Um, neither of those people is seen in the states as a as a Biden challenger who who could replace who who they think can beat him and would be the nominee general election. But I don't think Biden is in danger unless there's a, a medical emergency that is so stark, people say, well, we thank him for his service, but we need to nominate somebody else. And in that case, uh, that would be a historic mess for the, for the Democratic Party, um, matched with the Republican mess if Donald Trump is, is convicted of something or other in the next year. There is not really a plan, if he's the nominee, to dump him and replace him because there, you I think the difference when I'm comparing those two situations is that de- Republican base as it stands is much more devoted to Donald Trump than the Democratic base is, is to Joe Biden. Just the fact. He won the primary by a landslide it's in 2020. Math, man, don't worry. But it's math. <laughs> yeah, it's math. You know, you know this. Like, you can look at the polling. He is respected, and Democrats appreciate him, and they love that he's president, but they are not going to if if it let's say if, if if trump biden had a medical emergency there would not be the same you can't get rid of this guy attitude whereas if trump You're was convicted me, be, I mean, you cannot get rid of this guy attitude not to the level I mean, but, but I'm, I'm splitting hairs go no, ahead sorry. i talked to a lot of dems who are eager to get rid of joe honestly I mean, yes just, yes like, oh, we can't okay that's joe. What, it's like <laughs> I, well, the way you were laughing <laughs> i was like are you disagreeing no you're agreeing but it, like make it better point. oh yeah no, I'm, I'm, I'm laughing at the fact that it's like the republican base like won't won't you know, go with anyone else, even if Trump is uh, behind bars. So let, let's um, so let's explore this further for a moment. Um, so first, let me say that uh, I, I uh, find it ridiculous that the Beltway and media conversation is so disparate from ordinary, everyday American conversation. Because guess what? The guy's going to be 82 in 2024. Like actuarially yeah. speaking, there is, uh, you know, an almost 50 percent chance that Joe Biden does not make it through a second term. Uh, and there is very, very little confidence in uh, his VP to take over. Um, and so, you know, you're looking at the situation like the average American is like, what is going on here? Uh, and I've spent a lot of time with Joe Biden, um, not recently, but like on the campaign trail. Um, you know, he, he wasn't tip top prime Joe Biden uh, three or four years ago. And uh, it's clear that the job has just like it has everyone else except maybe Donald Trump. It's like taking its toll on him. <laughs> you know, <laughs> like yeah. you see, you're like, holy cow. And by the way, I've talked to people who are around Joe Biden personally now, and they will say to me, it's like, you know, it's different now even than it was two or three years ago. So the, the, so the fact that if, if you have what strikes me as a very, very objective, common sense conversation, you get attacked as like ageist, Trump enabler, blah, blah, blah. It's like, come on. Like every American... I talk to just says these three words to me. He's too old. That, like, like I, get, I get those three words all the time. So, uh, you know, and I, I'd like, you know, I mean, I think Joe and Jill are, are really great, uh, 
public servants, uh, you know, and, and but th- that like these two things can both exist and be true. Um, so it, let's say that Joe decides to, uh, or not decides to, either decides or, you know, has a decided for him where it's like, okay, it's next March and he's got a health problem, uh, you know, a- and people looking up saying, oh, snap. So the DNC, um, Jamie Harrison right now, um, so the, the DNC has already come out and said not having primary debates like RFK, Marianne Williamson, you know, not, not legitimate, tough luck, uh, essentially, um, those debates that they existed would be happening later this summer, <laughs> like later this year. So by next March, it would already have been like, uh, essentially a debate free season. Um, there might've been some States voting and then Joe, uh, gets the votes wins, let's say in, in the current world. Um, but then he has a health problem. And Jamie Harris and the DNC are like, oh, snap. Like, we can't run Joe in the general. Um, so what does their current day version of Donna Brazil's, uh, you know, uh, Joe Biden, Cory Booker ticket look like? Look, it would have to be led by uh, the vice president. And that, that's the one even stranger. I mean, if the... The the fact of a eighty year old president being being in a discussion of whether he's too old is is not it's new but it's it's you explain it to somebody uh, from Mars they'll say well that makes sense I don't know well I guess years pass differently on Mars but they, they, would, they would get the gist <laughs> Martian but, years uh, they would translate yeah. it to Martian years and be like hey yeah. that's old but the uh, the that's the part that's the most vexing for Democrats is that. Kamala Harris, uh, first female vice president in history, no one's ever made it this far, um, would would be the first female president if she nom- was nominated and and wins. And the conversation in in elite Democratic circles uh, and in I think the county party level is, oh, we just don't think that she could win, so we need to we need to think of something else. You can't just ignore sure. the <laughs> vice president and Kamala Harris. If something were to happen with Biden. Uh, she would be that is that is the vice president's role. She would be the heir apparent. I think it'd be a discussion of um, I, I don't think the party you you could game out fun scenarios. I don't think it's just possible <laughs> it, the realm, the reality we work in um, for the party to say we had a meeting and, and because uh, the vice president is polling kind of badly, we are replacing her with somebody else who polls better. I don't think they could. It would be it would be Harris and there'd be a DNC vote over uh the vice presidential candidate. A lot of horse trading there. That would be difficult. That'd be a controversy who even gets it. It's an ugly situation. I mean everyone the George McGovern losing to Nixon is still the biggest landslide defeat in like two party politics um in modern American history. Uh it was always going to be a loss, I think, for Democrats that in that election based on Dick's, based on the campaign Nixon's running. But what really sunk him and made him unelectable was he dropped his running mate and he, he picked uh, uh, Shriver uh, after after Eagleton was, I think, what, would, now, would now not be a career render. Which well, now like, would be totally fine in, as he had some mental health fine. issues. Yeah. yeah, he had depression. He, he, he went and won some uh, electroshock therapy. Um, but the fact that McGovern had to switch out his opponent the last bit just – I think it'd be impossible. I think it'd be impossible to just not nominate Kamala Harris, and that would be a crisis that I don't know how party would would um, would bounce back and win the election. Now, on paper, like all this is, sounds crazy because on paper you could say, well, there's some Demo- there's some Democrats who poll really well. Gretchen Whitmer is really popular. Um, there are people with crossover repeal. Josh Shapiro, the governor, they do have a bench of people that if you ask a Democratic strategist, they'll tell you, oh, can't wait for them to run for president in 2028. But they don't get that choice because Joe Biden's president, Kamala Harris, is vice president. I think the party is just in a bind. And the the easiest path to this, is, to, to winning, is Joe Biden becoming more popular and Kamala Harris becoming more popular through various decisions they make uh, and the economy going well. It is it is a very tough road. I think I've not. Yes, Donald Trump had issues going into the 2020 election, but this is the, the toughest set of, of, of just facts for an incumbent president facing re-election that I think I've seen, I've been alive 41 years, definitely the hardest. 60-something percent of voters saying they just don't think the person can do the job anymore. That is new and, and weird. Hey, YouTube. Glad you're enjoying the podcast. If you really like it, hit subscribe, and then YouTube will notify you every time we have a bang-up new guest. Thank you.
Yeah, I mean, he has. Uh, I think he just set a new uh, low for his approval rating uh, X months out. I've, I'm on the record saying I think there's a recession this year. I think it's already baked. Uh, Which is the know, best that could happen to Biden if there's a recession and, 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 there's, and people feel like and they're bouncing a, back. And a bounce but back by, good. by next year. <laughs> yeah, not as good as That's not true. a recession. But yeah. Better than a recession next year. It's yeah. true. So I, I obviously was very public saying, look, the Dems should have a freaking Democratic primary, in part because of what you're describing. is like there are a bunch of candidates who would be much better bets than Kamala, or in my opinion, Joe, honestly, um, for, for 2024. So of the folks who are prepping these campaigns before the midterm, the campaigns in waiting, the folks at the DNC would frankly have knocking on their door being like, hey, Joe's out, like, let me in there, uh, as ideally uh, the presidential candidate, but you know, maybe Kamala's Veep candidate. So the, the names I've heard, um, certainly Gretchen Whitmer, um, uh, as you say, in Michigan, Gavin Newsom in California, J.B. Pritzker in Illinois, where the DNC convention will be held, uh, you know, not not so coincidentally. <laughs> what? Who are the other folks that you think would be in that set of uh, to be considered? You know, you've left the party, so no offense when I say <laughs> like no, so many people run for president. Uh, I bet because I mentioned people who did run last cycle. Uh, I think Amy Klobuchar would would be in the mix again. Uh, Buddha Judge has a lot of supporters in local democratic politics around the country i know that if you turn on fox he's he's i think the most pinata democrat uh, in the administration i mean just him and mayorkas get the most negative attention for whatever they do um i don't I, but i've not seen a poll on him but he's very well liked among among democrats there'd be a question oh can he dr- drop out of the cabinet and run i think that would be the tight the the tight field because there's there's people who i think are you know condition or sorry position where they could run uh, Phil Murphy in New Jersey, Jay Inslee yes. in Washington, Roy Cooper, North Carolina. Roy, Roy Cooper is a name I've I've heard, but uh, just in terms of he, I mean, his record as a Democrat, uh, as a Democrat candidate, his win record is impressive to people. Uh, but he's not taking the same. I he's steps. not. He hasn't taken the same organizational steps, yeah, or not in the same. Yeah, I mean, Phil Murphy has like a pack that has been conspicuously spending money um, on behalf of Democrats around the country, not. Well, well, well Phil not Murphy like here's also like has... old field of Iowa people, but like to get yeah, yeah. to he's been meeting Democrats around the country. Roy Cooper meets them too, but Phil Murphy's like I, th- I think people come away from Murphy thinking he might want to this run. This dude for wants to run. Someday. Yeah, yeah. Well, plus Phil Murphy has a bankroll to throw around too. You know, oh, I mean, in a way that few other politicos do. J.B. Pritzker is a billionaire. Phil Murphy, I think, is probably a centimillionaire. Yeah, he has less money than Pritzker does, um, but and he has he is finishing up. Uh, his second term, I mean, he's he's out in uh, 2025. So that would be the mix of people, and that would be, I think, that'd be the conversation if we're just teleporting ourselves to a crisis in you know August 2024. I think it'd be okay. Well, it's Kamala Harris, and there you know there'd be a little bit of identity politics ticket balancing. I think of saying, okay, well, we have because um, this was a conversation. I was a little bit. I think I was a little bit skeptical of, and it was a good one in 2016 when Hillary was the front runner. The question was, can you have a ticket that's two women? Uh, same thing when Elizabeth Warren was briefly the front runner. It's like, okay, well, I guess we're going to have a male running mate. When Joe Biden was running, you know, famously promises, I'm only going to pick a female running mate. There probably would be a, a balancing there of saying, we're not. Let's not say it out loud, but um, there's a black female pre- uh, presidential nominee. Uh, should it be the White guy governor of New Jersey should be the white guy governor of Illinois. Should be the white the white guy governor of, of Pennsylvania. Um, and I think Whitmer and Klobuchar would be in in the discussion, but Democrats would reckon with. All right, do we want an all female ticket? Um, we've gotten halfway there. We've nominated you know Hillary. We elected the first female vice president. What do we want? Uh, what what do, we, what do we want to go? What's the image we want to present to the the country? When Democrats are looking at the, the field and saying, okay, in normal circumstances, we might be in bad shape, but uh, Dobbs, but like the alienation that uh, the Republican Party has done for suburban women, maybe that would be fine. But it'd be pretty tight. I think fewer people in the mix of who could be a, a Democratic vice president than than ran for president uh, in twenty in twenty twenty. I mean, you would not get twenty six people in the mix. It'd be who is somebody that voters would meet and say, right, yeah, they could, they could do the job. Uh, they could be vice president. It would just be some, one of those governors and one somebody he ran before. Well, we all know that the voters uh, vote at the top of the ticket. And I, I'm mm-hmm. going to say to you, even though you, you're saying, and you know, like a lot of people saying what you're saying is like, look, they can't just bypass Kamala. 
But to the average American, they're like Kamala, like President Kamala. I'm not pumped about. I wasn't pumped about Veep Kamala, like this President mm-hmm. Kamala thing. And polling bears that out. Uh, I, I'm going to say I think Kamala loses to Trump. Uh, you know, I can see the case where Joe can eke it out. Uh, you know, like that that thing's pretty close. But I think Kamala just loses that th- that that race head to head. I you know, and the Dems now are at a point where it's not like you can like throw a cycle away. <laughs> you can't be like, oh, we'll get him next time. <laughs> you know, <laughs> it, 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 mm-hmm. this. So, um, I, you know, I, I think that's like a very, very nasty situation. Um, it's one reason why I thought that, look, just like have a genuine process. If Kamala can emerge um, from a competitive primary victorious, then, you know, fantastic. She would have won over a lot of people. Um, but, uh, you know, I think going with her as the top of the ticket because, you know, you're afraid of um, alienating, uh, you know, like the, the, the Democrats, African-American base. Uh, like, I, I just think that would lead to, uh, a loss in November. Um, and, but yeah. and you were saying, look, um, you know, a lot of Democrats frank, frankly see the same thing. Um, but the question is like, w- would they just be like, well, can't, you know, like can't, uh, overlook the, the vice president, you know, we, you know so let, let's just try our best. I, I think there's a couple of situations. One is is what happens in 2028. I think you're right. Um, but um, public opinion is movable, and people have been. I mean, Richard Dixon dealt with this. The idea of Richard Dixon as as presidential nominee in 1960 was even as, as ludicrous to some people because of the image he had as kind of a gopher uh, who who Ike didn't really trust. Um, there would be some image making in trying to make uh, Kamala Harris different. I also think in the situation, the night, the nightmare thing I was talking about for Democrats, there would be a lot of Democrats who say, wake up and say, OK, well, I was you know what? What do I actually think about Kamala Harris as president? Let me see the, the you know, the, let me imagine the memes of the first female president. Let me see, how would I feel about her getting sworn in? I think Democrats would be a lot. I think she will benefit from Democrats um, thinking about her as president. It's, uh, her weaknesses are really just the things that have that hurt her campaign in 2020 and the things that uh, really struck, staggered her for a, lo- a lot of the vice presidency, which is that um, she has been assigned kind of unpopular causes and she has not. Um, how do I put, how do I put it? I mean, she she as a campaigner, I mean, she has a way of kind of like over talking things, saying saying like saying things that that republicans clip for videos that may that where they hit, they take the t- the most o- incoherent 20 seconds uh, they just she has not got this reputation and i've i i've seen this you know i've seen and been in speeches where she's rallying people i was in nashville uh when she was coming into nashville to speak to the state reps who got kicked out and she can w- rev up a room uh but she has been i think to find a lot of media and republican social media is very good at shaping this as just like somebody who can't campaign effectively and it's not going to be Dude, an Dude, I, I, i've got to say yeah. i completely disagree with your your read um, oh great the, in, okay please in, that's you know, good i'm in, i'm fine in, to disagree because i've been agreeing too much with you <laughs> no i know i know i mean just on this is like because i was in that democratic primary uh, alongside kamala and she was not underperforming because the republicans were like you know like like misshaping her um uh her speeches or like clipping things she just wasn't connecting you know like yeah. I, I was with her in Iowa she had the bus and I did not um <laughs> you know and 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 she dropped out yeah. um because it it wasn't going well um mm-hmm. so like that there there's a a real gap um and when you talk about hey if the democratic party were to go with her there would be all of this burnishing and and star making Oh, I'm sure there would be a real effort in that direction. <laughs> but, yeah, absolutely. But, but, yeah. but, but like, I, I think that her, uh, her image isn't just, frankly, an image. I mean, there is actually some reality to these human beings and, like, the, uh, like you know, the, the feelings and takeaways that people have about them. Um, but I, I just don't think that uh, this is something that, like, a good PR team and campaign <laughs> – I mean, like, it's, it, I think in another era – this is the way it worked is like, you know, Democrats picked someone, the machine said, look how awesome this person is. And then everyone's like, oh, I guess this person's awesome. And then, you know, we're, we're into it. I mean, I, I think Kamala's had multiple uh, stanzas like in the eye of Democratic primary voters. I mean, you know, campaign for months. Uh, she was on, you know, maybe five debate stages. Like people have seen it and felt it. Uh, and, and so she's not some new figure that you can be like, oh, like, let's make her awesome. Yeah, I was I was trying to be 
careful in how I described it, but I wasn't saying it was just people memed her out of out of the out of the race. I mean, like, the exchange with Tulsi Gabbard, which I think defined her for a lot of people on the left, fine Harris, um, was her not being prepared really to deal with somebody just with nothing to lose dumping on her uh, her prosecutorial record. Um, this is a lot you could say about this. I mean, the image that she had um, in, but when she ran for Senate, when she was Attorney General of California, she led on a bunch of of, of criminal justice issues, uh, not just criminal justice reform, but she was seen, she, her political career started as the tougher on crime prosecutor who beat somebody who was less tough on crime. She was going to be smart on crime, as her book said. Um, just a lot of issues that ended up not playing, like she didn't run on the... The, the, did run the, on a, a basket of issues that she had known and worked on as a California politician, she defined herself as something else, and it was never a good fit. I mean, I think it's, it's probably good if somebody just can't, on a dime, change their entire personality. But yeah, she was really flat-footed when she had to defend stuff that wasn't um, de in the in the Democratic primary. And uh, I mean, I think one of the first mistakes she made was she had she agreed that she supported Medicare for all. Uh, she was asked about the implications of of phasing out private insurance, and and she s- suggested on a CNN t- town hall that she would, and wasn't what, ready to defend it. Like just on those, I think she has uh, in the administration. It's clear what she's, you know, what she what she supports, what she what she doesn't. But yeah, she was flat footed in in a lot of ways in that Democratic primary. She was on on their game in as a VP nominee in the debate with Mike Pence, she delivered yep. completely as a, as a candidate at the national stage at that level. So that's the, what I'm trying to get my head around is that she had a lot of talent as a California politician. Um, she fumbled the ball when she started running for president and it was on issues that she, um, you know, that were popular, but she didn't really have the, um, a, a passion about cause she hadn't talked about them before. Um, but I, 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 I don't want to do even, this is, very fun speculation, but I just the one thing I think it I, I thought about that is not obvious is yeah what would happen because this happens at the lower level there is somebody who's lieutenant governor and nobody thinks lieutenant governor could win on their own or handle the job they come into the job people say well I'm I have complicated feelings about how the governor resigned or the governor died or the governor took another job but this lieutenant governor is really putting it together in a way that surprises me I think there is a chance for a honeymoon depending how this goes but um. But no, I mean, it, the, the, the party is uh, has a front runner in waiting who most of the party thinks cannot win. That's the gist. That's the gist of it. And I think they would need to just change the facts about Kamala Harris and she would need to change people's impressions and the facts they know about her for her to be a competitive candidate. That's really tough. It's much more fun for Democrats to say, gosh, couldn't we just do a draft and find like a governor who's really good at this? This podcast is sponsored by Helix Sleep. I have always been someone who thought spending a little extra on your mattress is a wise investment because you spend, let's say, a third of your life on it. It makes you healthier, more energized. Maybe there are even other people that enjoy your mattress too, whether it's kids or that extra special someone. Helix Sleep is the mattress company we recommend. It includes 14 unique mattresses. You can have a personalized mattress Ship straight to your door, free of charge, and they are so confident they will give you a 100-night trial. Yep, you can sleep on it for three months after you take that Helix Sleep quiz, figure out the best mattress for you, sent straight to your door. Don't trust me alone. My kids also can't get enough of this mattress. Helix is offering 20% off all mattress orders and two free pillows. For our listeners, go to helixsleep.com slash yang. This is their best offer yet. And it won't last long. With Helix, better sleep starts now. Yeah, it's someone who's frankly a little bit uh, fresher and undefined in the public mind. By the way, I was standing between uh, Tulsi and Kamala when Tulsi was uh, going after her. And that was yeah. deeply uncomfortable because you're like, wow, these two are like really savaging each other. Well, I mean, you know, like, yeah, they were savaging each other. And, yeah, but she uh, didn't have like, that one had... response. It's that, like there was a way to knock somebody out who comes after you, right? And she didn't do it. So that was. Uh, um, yeah, yeah. It, it was. But yeah, I was literally on that stage. Um, but but, but between could, the two tell. of them, you can you know you can you could look up that you know there's probably a pic somewhere of me like <laughs> like awkwardly turning my head back and forth. So 
Okay, so that is the the, the democratic side field. <laughs> Good times uh, uh, um, uh, on their side. On the other side of the coin, uh, it looks like freaking DeSantis has deflated before launching, uh, and Trump now is a twenty point lead. I personally know of uh, five um, candidates who I think declare in the Republican field in the next month. Um, so field's going to grow. Um, it feels like it's uh, Trump's to lose at this point. The indictment seems like it did him uh, massive service by uh, coalescing the base around him and, and having him dominate coverage. Uh, are you seeing and hearing uh, anything different? I'm not. Uh, so the indictment I didn't, did a couple things. One, uh, yes, it did. Every Republican, uh, every Republican who commented on that, um, even if they're running against him, with the exception of Asa Hutchinson, said it was completely bogus. It was a affront to justice. They defended him. Um, th- that's a major factor helping Trump in this primary is that just no one wants to actually attack him. Uh, they, if they do. It is some sort of sideways electability critique like the one Nikki Haley makes that, well, you know, we need somebody who can win uh, and we haven't won the popular vote. Hint, hint. Donald Trump didn't win that. Or it's Vivek uh, Ramaswamy saying Trump is great. I can do better. Uh, Or it's DeSantis, who remember uh, when Trump got indicted, he offered to how would I put it? I mean, he basically offered to uh, not shelter him him and fight off the shelter him. Yeah. Yeah. Like he was really letting you to hide, hide him out and, and be, uh, and not, not even let the government br- uh, bring him in the new, I say New York, bring him in. Uh, so they all defended him. Um, I think it also, and this happens with a lot of things, something is unthinkable, then it happens. I mean, one, one example is it was unthinkable. What would happen if Joe Biden fell down the stairs of air force one? Well, he tripped on the stairs. It happened. And then he kept being president. Like, and same thing with, with Trump and indictment. I, I think this has happened several times to him. Uh, what happens if he'll be impeached? Certainly that's going to be a crisis and it's going to collapse. And then he got impeached, then he got impeached again. What happens if he, he it was yet another example of, of Trump taking some sort of um, blow that would destroy, I think, a governor or candidate for Congress and then just kind of forging ahead. So it, every time that happens, anyone but you're Trump, inoculated. Honestly. I mean, yeah, yeah. anyone but Trump. Yeah, I mean, well, I mean, but he, like this is Biden's benefited from. I just mentioned the stairs, but there's a lot of stuff that has hap- that, that will come out, like accusations or news about the Hunter Biden investigation, and people just say, uh, "All right, well." Um, Biden also kind of Teflon-y, You're right. What are you gonna do? <laughs> what are you gonna do about this? Yeah, it's some politicians have that. Trump has more of that ability. Uh, I think that helped a lot, but I think it's it's um, he also has been the most direct candidate in their field in saying what he's going to run on. He has a policy agenda uh, i think is almost written about too little i like writing about it but i feel sometimes he'll he'll lay out some policies that are very far right that are very close to what the, i think a lot of the base republican party wants they do get broadcast in conservative media they might not get broadcast for everybody else i think he just he's run a campaign that's that's much more that's been effective at saying put me back in here's what i'll do and and the thing that yes there have not been you know people who lost the the presidency and, can't, and come back in, in uh, 140 years. But the, his basic argument, which, again, every Republican is running against him, is, is um, vouching for, is that when th- he was president, things were great. Things were good. And bring me back and things will be great things again. Things will be good again. Very simple. I mean, you saw in the, in the Washington Post ABC poll this, uh, this on Sunday when people are asked, you know, who was better at handling the economy, they'll, they say Trump was. And if you're a Democrat, you say that's crazy. I mean, he, he left office with, with unemployment at eight or 9%. Um, the economy, like things went to a tailspin. Democrats had to bail him out with checks to people with, with, a with, a, a COVID recovery. And Biden has created more jobs than any president has in not, we, I mean, preside over the creation of more jobs thing. I think uh, Trump has benefited for benefited from, there are not many people alive who've done this job. And there are things that people uh, think were handled better when he was president. They just are. They if uh, Republicans focus very early on the uh, you know the U.S. Mexico border, uh, that has been a huge advantage for Trump. Of just people saying, I don't remember seeing yet. W- was this happening? Well, that's that's a, that's a big issue <laughs> because the the Trump administration uh, was it had a very unpopular immigration policy, uh, one that was, you know, condemned as inhumane by every Democrat, one that was a political problem for him, but it's been kind of retconned into, well, we didn't have to see all these, all this footage of 10,000 people at the, at the border. And this is much worse. Biden can't handle it. Um, a lot of that, I think he's benefited from a lot of, uh, 
uh, rose-colored reminiscence of, I don't remember this particular problem. I don't remember inflation when he was president. I don't remember um, it, it, even things were, you know, had he been president and presided over the uh, Afghanistan withdrawal, probably would have gone the same way. But he can retcon that as, well, that didn't happen when I was president. I think he just can do that in lots of ways. So even in the conversation uh, you just shared, Dave, you're pretty much fast forwarding to the general. And, and so one of the things I said to someone in conversation is that like him or not, Trump is a star. And uh, the Republicans, uh, I, the machinery is having trouble manufacturing another star. In my opinion, they kind of tried to manufacture Ron DeSantis into that kind of star, and then it deflated when some more people met him. <laughs> and we're like, wait, this dude, like, you know, like this guy, like doesn't have the personality, doesn't have the charisma, doesn't have the affect, has had some missteps. Um, so, uh, so you're fast forwarding to the general. Who has, and you know, DeSantis could turn it around in a particular forum. I mean, he hasn't declared yet. Maybe he'll start campaigning well. Uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm dubious. Uh, you know, like I, I am one of the people that's like, look, if you're going to stop Trump, like I don't, I mean, DeSantis might be part of that, but I think it's going to be someone else. So I'm looking at other Republican uh, candidates who have a very, very high ceiling. Um, I think Tim Scott's got a very high ceiling, uh, you know, um, but there's going to have to be massive consolidation because you already have... Um, four or five candidates who are out there. I think they're going to be another five more, including uh, probably Governor Asa Hutchinson, who you just named. So, well, he's already uh, running. Know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But Tim Scott's on the twenty second. DeSantis TBD, um, and we're uh, we're in the sort the sort of I call like shiny object season where um, people are not happy with not everyone, but some Republicans are not happy with uh, their options. So they're trying they're they're kind of wish casting. Oh, could Brian Kemp run? Could Glenn Young could run? Not much evidence that like Republicans want more alternatives than Trump and DeSantis, right? Yeah, and Youngkin just said he's not running. So uh, it's so so uh, in your mind is this pretty much like, hey, we're going to have some debates and whatnot, but Trump's going to yeah. steamroll. Well, the debates question is complicated because you might not get um, Trump showing up to the first one or two debates, um, and I think beyond him skipping, what's also possible is a debate where. People show up and they don't want to com uh, combat with him. That's what happened in 2015. Yeah, uh, yeah in that primary, there were Jeb Bush would go after him. Rick Perry would talk about him. Um, he was just kept off the main stage. Uh, it's possible that they take the Ted Cruz approach and just say, like, look, I know the media wants us to attack each other, but I just want to build on the legacy of what Donald Trump did. Um, it's also yeah, totally. like the world's not like the West Wing. Like sometimes <laughs> somebody could be planning. You saw with Chris Christie's media tour. If Chris Christie ran and he got on the debate stage, everyone has a plan until he get punched in the face. Maybe he has a zinger. Maybe Trump has a better zinger, <laughs> and that's the end of that. Um, but I think in the primary, I wouldn't say it's over. I just think um, from the polling we've seen, Republicans, they were very worried for a few weeks after the midterms, maybe a few months, on the electability factor of, okay, will this guy just help nominate a bunch of losers in swing states? Uh, and we don't have the Senate. It's his fault. But that kind of faded. Uh, we're back to the, the, what I was talking about before, which is the the median Republican thinks things were great uh, under Trump. I want them back. And they hear other Republicans say, yes, things were great under Trump. Uh, OK, well, then why would I vote for you over him? I don't even think you need to get in the weeds of like, are there which five issues they think he'd be better on? It's they need to be convinced, well, Trump can't win, but he can. And I don't think they're there. I think you'd need. Um, some more events to happen for people to be convinced. This poll over the weekend that I mentioned, where uh, Trump is ahead of Biden and as is DeSantis, that's really all Trump needs. Just to, you know, hey, the media... No, I you, can win. Well, he's already saying no. you don't need to trust the polls, but if you do, if you're one of the people who don't trust the polls, there's no evidence that I'm going to lose. I, mean, I talked to um, public opinion strategies who were very DeSantis curious, and they put a, a series of polls out over the last few years, uh, over the last few months, I should say, um, Paid for by a nonprofit that supports DeSantis saying, oh, hey, there's look at Wisconsin, look at Pennsylvania, look at Arizona. DeSantis is narrowly ahead. Trump is narrowly behind. And I think something like the, the post poll, any coverage of that um, wipes that off the, the, the blackboard. Now people say, all right, well, no, here's a poll that says he'd win. So why should I pay attention to this other poll? Um, and look, they need there's just not he's not uh, the, the current Republican coalition. There is a core of voters who want to vote Republican, but don't want to vote for him, but they're not big enough that they're not a majority of the base. The majority of yep. Republican voters are happy with them.
I am pumped to announce that I have a novel coming out on September 12th, The Last Election. It's a political thriller co-written with my friend Stephen Marsh, who wrote the book The Next Civil War. If you listen to this podcast, Stephen's been a repeat guest. Stephen and I became friends and thought we should collaborate on a way to scare the shit out of people, but also entertain them with a story of what could happen in this upcoming election or the election thereafter. Do check it out at andrewyang.com slash books. And there's a special discount code last election that you can use for 30% off at the publisher's website. I'll be talking more about this book, but I'm so pumped to get this out into the world. Last election coming your way. All right, so we've discussed the Democrats, the Republicans, and now the famed other field. Um, so there's scuttlebutt that Joe Manchin wants to run uh, on a No Labels Unity ticket. Um, and No Labels has uh, marched around the country getting ballot access, preparing for a potential uh, 24 ticket. Um, have you heard anything about this? Like, there, there's been a lot of press. Uh, bashing no labels, yeah. saying, look, if they do this, it's going to uh, enable Trump. Yeah. Um, uh, are you hearing anything about a Manchin-led uh, presidential run? I haven't heard anything more than a rumor on that. Manchin, how would I put it? Uh, he has not said enough definitive things about this. I don't think that uh, – I think that no labels wants him. I know that no labels after after Joe Biden uh, – sorry, after Joe Manchin, after Larry Hogan – they don't have any any names that they think would get immediate media credibility if they ran as a third party. This is what's happened with other efforts to create a third party, start it up, and then have a candidate uh, on top of it. And that's what Americans elect in 2008. Uh, there's another effort in um, – uh, no, it's a Unity – sorry, Unity 08 in 2008. Um, Americans elect 2012. In both cases, they said, what we really like is Mike Bloomberg to run, and then he didn't. <laughs> and then when he eventually ran as a presidential candidate. So I don't think um, – Manchin has not ruled it out, but I think that's because once you rule that out, you lose some leverage. It helps Manchin at the moment where Democrats, uh, where the White House, certainly the people who the policy folks, the White House, who are watching Manchin call for permitting reform and get angry and talk about repealing the IRA. I think it helps Manchin the conversation to hint that he might be the, the, he, the to not say he would never run for president. I don't think it's super likely. It's also in, in this conversation we're having uh, Manchin, if, if there was a race between Trump and Manchin and Biden, uh, Manchin would be the uh, the third seventy something can year old candidate. I mean, he's he is at the end of his political career. He maybe he wins one more term in the Senate. Maybe he runs for one more term as governor. But that's kind of it. I mean, this is this is a uh, this is this He'll be seventy four. I think. Yeah. Yeah, he's he's in his he's seventy five now. He's turning seventy six oh, this well, summer. Right. So he'd be that. he would be as old. <laughs> I mean. He, Oh, my so bad. there's lots of reasons where he's 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 a compelling candidate. I think I underestimated and, his age. <laughs> oh, he keeps he takes care of himself, man. I've seen him, you know, wearing like the tight like uh, uh, coal uh, coal miners union polo shirt when he's campaigning, and he's incredible retail campaigner. I've seen that, but president's not a retail campaign thing. So anyway, I don't want to over over egg my answer. I just think it's good for him to be in this mix. Um, the problem the labels has confronted is yes, Democrats look. Uh, it's just 2016, 2000 define their thinking. Um, they will do anything to avoid a third party, a credible third party that would take votes away, uh, or even a less credible third party. I think one thing we've not, um, you and I haven't talked about, but also I haven't heard much conversation in DC about, is what would happen if um, Robert F. Kennedy Jr. was convinced to run as a third party candidate. I oh, don't think snap. he would take. That's true. You know, I don't. I think most Democrats are so traumatized by 2016 that they wouldn't even consider it. But that would be one more problem for them to deal with, and one more. I mean, what happens? If I mean, that, incredible, yeah. Go, go ahead. Sorry. That, no, that, that that makes a lot of sense because he's not going to get a fair shake from the DNC. They're going to be no debates, and he's like, "Hang this! I'm going to run third party." I mean, that that would be a reasonable course. Yeah, it's it's something. I remember. I know in in twenty when you were running in twenty twenty, that's the the DNC. It, there were critics of its debate strategy and how it handled everything, but they wanted to make sure that. You or Tulsi Gabbard or some Democrat with appeal to independence did not say screw this and just run third party. Um, I mean, they got to know you and they're like, oh, you're never going to do that. That's fine. Like you're not going to you're not going to try to spoil this election. Um, but that that risk exists, and that um, 
a really helpful group of voters for Biden in 2020 were were people who said they didn't like Trump, they didn't like Biden. Those voters went overwhelmingly more than two to one yeah. for Biden. Um, sure. Anything that takes that voter off the table and 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 parks him with a a Robert Kennedy, a Tulsi, uh, a Joe Manchin, a Larry Hogan, just naming the people that they're, I've mentioned or in the conversation, any of those voters they think would be they would be winnable for a a Biden campaign. It's okay, you're not happy, but do you really want to go back to Trump? They could park their vote with somebody else. Um, they're worried about that. So with no labels, they're they're. They're serious about it, but you even saw, and you saw some of the reporting from Tara Palmieri this week, um, the people who are part of No Labels don't want to be part of that. For the same reason, they don't want to have to go home and, you know, have the kind of conversation James Comey has all the time, was, hey, man, did you are you the reason that we have Donald Trump as president? Uh, they don't want to live live through that. So I think it's a very fraught, fraught thing for No Labels to work through. Um, fraught for, it's in the short term, not a problem for, for Manchin. He's in the mix. He gets more bookings on TV, more people talk to him. Um, but if no labels were to actually do it and get on these states, it's going to be it's going to be knockdown drag out between Democratic Party and no labels and all these places. I even saw it in the places where they've been getting on the ballot. Uh, and you've been there with forward party in some of these places. Um, yeah, you probably Arizona, detected, you're thinking for sure. Yeah, how much how much have you detected Democrats saying like like what can we do about these people trying to get in the ballot as an alternative? Like how much have you um, oh, yeah, heard yeah, about them no. trying to kick you off? Uh, I mean, yeah, yeah, I, I, I have heard that. And and, the, and I just do want to say, so No Labels is focused on the presidential. Forward is focused on the local, like the half million local races. We just had our first mayor switch to the party in Newberry, Florida. So, uh, you know, very different uh, approaches, very, very different tax, in part for some of the reasons you're describing. Um but uh, but yeah, like I I did hear from some folks in Arizona that uh, you know Dem- Dems are uh, like very unhappy about um, new market entrants. Yeah, they are. I mean, and in two thousand four, when Nader was getting about as an independent, there were lots of lawsuits to get him off. I think it'd be like that. I think Democrats would. Uh, what options do we have to get this party off the ballot? Uh, all that takes time. It's a rear guard effort. But the reason they would do it is to say, well. We feel better about an election where there's going to be a lot of unhappy voters who vote for Biden because they have no choice. Uh, oh, yeah. Still, yeah. yeah, that's that's what they that's what they want. But I think there is going to be some Republicans who say, well, I didn't like Trump, but I can put up with it. There will be Democrats who say, I wish there was a younger candidate, but it's Biden. That's fine. That's already been happening a little bit. But there's a big share of the country. Uh, I think it'd be bigger than 2016 that say, I just can't believe these are my choices. And that's going to be a lot of Democratic strategy is. That's right. Then you just stick it out with Biden. These again. are it's your like, choices. Yeah. Like, you know, Wait yeah. it out. Like if we beat Trump again, then you don't have to worry about him in the future. Uh, not in a very inspiring campaign, but not every campaign is inspiring. I mean, it's crazy yeah. that we, we all lived through 2008. I, and it's, I almost, you know, I'm not that old. You're not that old. But like I'll meet somebody who's 20 and I'll tell him, you know, there was an election pretty recently where most voters said, I like them both. I like both these choices. <laughs> We've not been there in a long time. Yeah, good good times in the USA. If only we had something like ranked choice voting, and then like you could actually not have this uh, this binary where it's like hold your nose, people, hold your nose. Um, Dave Weigel, uh, how can people follow you, your thoughts, uh, and your work at Semaphore? So I'm on both uh, Twitter and Blue Sky. If you've heard about Blue Sky, um, with just my name at Dave Weigel, I use those to kind of boost where where things are going. The website is semaphore.com. I have a, a newsletter that you can subscribe to. You can subscribe to a bunch, uh, flagship, uh, Ben Smith's media newsletter. Um, but it's called Americana, and it's it's honestly it's what I did with at the Washington Post. I think it's the angle's a little bit um, not even the angle. The angle's the same. It's I go around the country. I talk to campaigns. I if there's an issue that's fascinating that I think is 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 affecting the politics. I Man, I wrote last week about new laws that are going to be up, uh, tested in court about banning access to pornography for minors. The next story I'm writing is about the race from Mayor Philadelphia. So yeah, Fun. semaphore.com and the newsletter Americana. That's like all my reporting from around the country covering these elections. I, Dave, I think people should subscribe because you call it like you see it uh, and you're impeccably sourced. Thank you so much, Dave. We'll have you back when there there's more um stuff maybe after this debt limit fiasco uh is resolved there'll be some new fiasco we can unpack yeah i i love i mean this is the weirdest election that we've lived through and we could have said that the last four elections but uh it, it, once i talk to you about it and i hear your your perspective for having lived through one of them you know it's it, there's a lot to go over so i really appreciate having the time to, to go through it with you 
Of course, man. I hear last time there was some guy talking about AI. I wonder when that's going to be relevant. <laughs> you told, you tried to tell us. <laughs> like, you, tried to, you, you told them. I like uh, every 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 time I see one of these VC guys saying, "Hey, you know how many people we can fire? How great it would be!" Uh, like I think I think of uh, you warning people in Iowa that this is going to happen. <laughs> Dude, I I was freaking like going to the people of Iowa, be like, "God, it's going to be up to you to freaking turn this tide." Yeah. And for the five percent of Iowans who supported me in the caucus, thank you. For the rest of you who just wanted to have a beer with me, um, Mr. Chaz this time. <laughs> 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 but thanks, Dave. Uh, everyone should keep up with your work, uh, and would be thrilled to have you back here. Thanks, I really appreciate it. Happy to do it. <laughs> <laughs>